This is a story like no other. This is a story about two twins that y'all definitely don't want to miss. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. It's crazy because a lot of people claim to be their brother's keeper. But after you see this story, after you listen to this story, you're going to know the true definition of being your brother's keeper. Yo, once again, it's on. Back at you one more again. Real Ken's TV in the house like kitchen sinks. You know, I ran into an old uh, a childhood friend of mine today. And, you know, we spoke briefly. And it had me reminiscing um, about some of our childhood memories that we shared. So I want to let you all in on the, um, I guess, the conversation, uh, if you will, that we had. Um and I'm going to paint a picture for you so you'll have a better uh, or an exact, rather, understanding of this story that I'm bringing you, if that makes any sense. It's two twins. Twin brothers. JT and TJ. JT and TJ, we were the exact same age. They may have been a couple months older than me, but, you know, we were the exact same age. We didn't come up in the same neighborhood together, but we came up around each other like, you know, we, we played baseball together. And, um, you know, my, my grandmother lived uh, kind of close to where they lived at, so we would often see each other in the parks. We were always cool, man. Never had a problem with each other. And that's actually odd because they were known for jumping people. You see what I'm saying? If one of them gets into it with you, they're both going to get into it with you, basically. And these guys, man, they were given the gift. I'm talking about they were blessed to be super athletes. Um, they weren't that big. They were probably maybe 5'10", 5'11". But they were super athletes, man. I'm talking about football, baseball, and basketball. And oftentimes when you see a twin, it's like, okay, or brothers, just regular brothers. One of them's better than the other. These two were like neck and neck. You know, one was a little bit better than the other, but nothing significant. Uh, every league that they played in, they made all-stars. Um, you know, and they had a name for themselves. So coming up through the, you know, 11, 12, um, then you get to the, you know, your teenage years or what have you. You get to middle school. They're playing all three sports. All-stars in every sport. They get to high school. The same situation. But see, the thing about it, and you all that are sports moms or sports dads, you know that the politics become involved. And so one of the twins, he wasn't playing as much on the basketball team. So he quit the basketball team. Now his brother's still on the team, but he's bitter a little. I don't even want to say bitter, but he's not very happy because he knows his brother should be out there playing. But yet he's playing, so he can't really just up and quit. But he feels as though, man, my brother should be out here, you know, playing along with me. So, you know, he kind of develops an attitude with the coach. They both play football. They both play baseball. And um, they're shining. I'm not even going to lie. They're, they're, they're exceeding. They start to get into the streets. They start to get into the fast money. Now, when I say they, it initially started with the one that quit basketball. Now, once he quit basketball... He was still, like I said, playing football and baseball. Football season is before basketball season. So football season had already concluded. So it's basketball season. He quits. He's not really doing anything. So he starts to get, you know, into the street life. He's hustling. He's making his money. At first, it's just a little bit of money, you know, a little pocket change or what have you. He's in high school. Then he becomes, you know, the, the pocket change starts to turn into some real money as far as, you know, for a high school teenager. So now he's really, really getting it. But it's kind of hard to balance the two because baseball season rolls around and he's not really wanting to go to uh, workouts and, you know, lift weights and all that stuff because he's too busy getting his money out in the streets. So eventually he quits baseball. He quits baseball. He's full-fledged into the streets. The other brother, he's still playing. He's still trying to maintain. He's doing very, very well. So as some time goes by, because this was early on, this was maybe their sophomore year. 
So as some time goes past, by the time they were seniors, the one brother that continued to play, which was, would you say JT? Because they're identical twins. I mean, same height, same everything. So would you say JT? JT's getting all type of uh, scholarship offers, you know, to play baseball and to play football. He was good in basketball, don't get me wrong, but they didn't really use him right. And as I mentioned, he was only 5'10", 5'11", so he wasn't really getting the offers like that in basketball. But in baseball and football, all type of schools were reaching out to him. So as time goes on, JT doesn't follow up and do the things that he's supposed to do. I think he takes his ACT and his SAT. Back then, those are the two... Uh, you know, tests that you had to take to get into college. I don't know what it is now. And even though he always maintained a 2.6, 2.7, 2.8 grade point average, those tests are, they don't, I don't even know why they make you take those tests because they're not really, you could, I've seen an individual that had a 3.7 the whole way through high school. And then when he had to take his uh, ACT, he could only score 18. So therefore he wasn't qualified to get the scholarship because he could only get an 18 on the test. Doesn't make you dumb, doesn't make you... It's just those tests are biased, and they don't mean anything. They're on the clock, and anyway, anyway, I don't want to get off into that. So he ends up not going to school. So now you have two twin brothers. As I mentioned, they're tight. They're, they didn't argue. i never seen the guys argue, never seen the guys, never heard about them arguing. One of them got into it. Like I said, they both going to get into it and they would just click tight. It was just those two. They end up catching a case. I'm sure you all knew that that was coming. A couple years out of high school, they're getting their money. They're grinding out here on the streets. They're popular. Everybody knows them. JT and TJ, they end up catching a case. They catch a case together. Trafficking. Trafficking a, a controlled substance. They go to court, end up going to trial. They get convicted. I believe they both get, I want to say, eight years. They get an eight-year sentence. I always tell people that watch the channel that in Kentucky, in the state of Kentucky, as long as your charge isn't deemed valence, any time that you get, you, you do 20% of your time, and then you're eligible for parole. So in an eight-year sentence... You're looking at probably, I don't know, a year and a half. I don't know the exact uh, figures off the top of my head. But I know that you do 14 months on six years, 17 months on seven years. You do 19 months on an eight-year sentence before you have an opportunity to go up to the parole board. Don't mean you're necessarily going to get out. just means for the 19 months I've been incarcerated, these are things I've been doing. This is how I've been working on myself. This is the mistake that I made. This is what I intend to do going forward. And, you know, I, it's my fault. I don't point the finger at anybody. I totally hold myself accountable. You know, those are the type of things that the parole board wants to hear. Trust me, I know. So, um, they have to do 19 months to the parole board. Now, they've been together them in their entire lives. Dressing alike, everything. Well, the problem is the Department of Corrections don't care anything about them being twins. They don't care. You know, so one of them gets sent to this uh, facility and the other one gets sent to another facility. Even though you can request to go to a certain location, that don't mean that don't necessarily mean that you're going to get there. So, in Lexington, Kentucky, there's a facility called Blackburn Correctional Complex. It's a prison, but it's a prison for low-level inmates. And at the time, this prison it was kind of like it's hard to explain. I don't necessarily want to say in the middle of nowhere, but there was nothing around the prison. Just a whole bunch of trees and grass and land around the prison. But it wasn't very far from the city whatsoever, if that makes any sense to you. And during these times, it was so laid back that guys would literally be able to walk off go to their girl's house or their girl would pick them up. You know, maybe they might have to walk a half a mile off the complex. A girl will pick them up. They go home, stay for a couple hours, come back, walk to the liquor store, go get them a drink, come back. That's how close it actually was to civiliz civilization. If that makes any sense to you. 
But you got to understand that, you know, when all of this was going on, this was like in the 90s. So early to early, early 2000s, maybe 2000s. So things were very, very lax back then. So one of the twins, we'll just say uh, TJ, he gets sent to Blackburn. The other twin, he gets sent to Bell County. Bell County's maybe three hours away. It's up in the sticks, up in the mountains. It's a cool laid back place, but you're not walking off because you're not getting through them woods. You got snakes, you got birds, you got all the, you're not getting through them woods. Nobody's even attempting to escape from Bell County Forestry Street Camp. That's what it was called, Bell County Forestry Camp. Well, it's still around, so that's what it is called. So you all that's watching this video and you're from Kentucky and you familiar with the prison system, you know. Bell County Forestry Camp. They fought fi uh, um, forest fires. So you would go there. If you get on the team that fights the fires or whatever, you make $300, $350, $400 a month. Well, a lot of people, probably $300, $450 a month or $350, uh, $400 a month or whatever. It doesn't seem like a lot. But in prison, that's a lot of money. Because then you could only spend, I think, $50 a week on commissary, maybe $75, at max $75. Well, the other jobs is only paying you $25, $30 bucks a month, maybe $60 if you work in the kitchen. So that $300, $350, $400, dollars whatever you were making fighting the, the fires, and then that's just regular time. They got overtime. So oftentimes, those guys would make five, six hundred bucks a month. And if you were smart, you were saving that money, saving it. Sometimes you send money home. That's what I used to do, send money home, you know, for my daughter or what have you, birthday, Christmas, school clothes, just anytime she needed anything. You know, it wouldn't be much, $150, $200, but I was never making the type of money that they made. So, like I said, the other one, he's at Bell County Forestry Camp. Every six months when you're in prison, you go up for reclassification. Now, when you go up for reclassification, basically what that means is they do an assessment of you. So you go before your caseworker. Every inmate is assigned a caseworker. And you go before, it's like a committee. And when you go before the committee, they make sure that you're doing everything that you're supposed to do. They assess your, uh, um, it's called a, um, what is it called? You Basically, you get graded. And you get graded by a score. So... If your score is low, like anything under eight, you're community. When you're community, that means you can be at one of these facilities. And you can also put in for a transfer. Again, doesn't mean that you're going to get sent to where you're trying to get sent to. Well, TJ gets sent to Blackburn with his brother JT. Finally reunited. Finally reunited. It's been a, a good year or so, but they're finally reunited. He gets down to Blackburn. Blackburn had a lot of dudes from Louisville, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky. It was about half and half. So he gets down there. Of course, everybody knows him. They know, you know, they know the twins. They've been in the streets. They grew up in Lexington. Everybody knows these dudes. They rock out, you know, um, just like they did on the streets. Now, being that this was a low level prison, really wasn't too much, you know, wasn't no stabbings, wasn't nothing like that. Now, it, it was some fights every once in a while, but nine times out of ten, people are on their best behavior because you're trying to go home. If you at this facility, you on your way home. Whether it's a year, two years, three years, six months, you're on your way home, opposed to being at those uh, actual prisons behind them walls, behind them gates with the barbed wire. Ain't no telling when you're going home. Being at a camp, there's no fence, as I mentioned. So you can literally just walk off. Now, let me explain something to you. Prison has counts. When I last got out of prison, they were counting, man, astronomically. They count you first thing in the morning at 7 o'clock. Then they do a 12 o'clock count. Then they're going to come back and do a 3 o'clock count. Then a 6 o'clock count. Then an 8 o'clock count. Back then, they count you in the morning when you first, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning. You don't even get counted again until like 5 o'clock. So you see the window that you have to maneuver and go do the things that you need or want to go and do. A situation happened to where they both went up for parole at the same exact time because they had the same exact case. And I'm going to tell you how crazy the parole board is. I don't seen people make parole that had write-ups didn't do a darn thing that they were recommended to do by the committee 
and still make parole. And then you would take an individual that didn't have any write-ups, stayed out of the way, stayed out of trouble. Um, everything that was recommended, he did it. Everything that they told him to do, he did it. And they give him a 15-month setback. A setback means come back and see us in 15 months. It's crazy, but that's just the way that it works. So one of the twins would just say uh, JT, because I get them mixed up too. And I grew up with the guys, man, you know, around them. JT makes parole. TJ, they give him 24 months. They tell him to come back in 24 months. Both of them are down in the dumps. The one that made parole, he really wanted to stay with his brother. You got to keep in mind, he didn't have any kids. You know, they were young then. Him and his brother was like this. He wanted to stay with his brother. But his brother's telling him like, nah, bro. You can do better for us both. You can get out there and do your thing. Because they already had it in uh, predetermined in their mind. They was getting back out there hustling. And as I always mention, if you watch my channel, you'll know in prison you need money. You know, phone calls cost. You can buy shoes. You can buy uh, sweatsuits. Commissary every week. Now, at this time, at this particular time, I failed to mention, you could still wear your own clothes. You literally could wear your own clothes in prison back then. They didn't change that until, I want to say, 2002, maybe, to where they went to the prison uniforms, the khaki shirts and the khaki pants, khaki hats. Everything was khaki with the uh, black state prison boots. But back then, you could wear anything. So you got dudes that's on the yard, man. They got J's on. They looking real, real fresh because they trying to impress the female uh, correction officers. Also, when you went to visit, you had uh, contact visits. You hug your girl, squeeze your girl, your wife, or whatever. And, you know, everything was really, really laid back. Had cool officers. You didn't really have a whole lot of jerks. You always going to have a jerk, but you didn't really have a whole lot of jerks back then. So he tells his brother, man, don't trip, man. You know, 24 months is two years, man. I'm, I'm going to be okay, man. Just go out there. Just, just hold me down. Hold me down means, shoot, man, just look out for me. Make sure you send something in here for me. No doubt. You ain't even got to tell me that. Twin gets out hustling. He goes right back to it. I'm talking about it ain't even a few days. He goes right back to it. He's on the block. No cell phones and all that back then. They had cell phones, you know, but they had the big phones. Like, they had the phones in the, in the that you, like, the little mini briefcases or whatever. You had to pull the phone out and hook it up to the uh, cigarette light. Actually, you know what? I'm lying. I'm lying. They had the small Nokia phones. So I'm actually lying. I take that back. They had the small Nokia phones to wear, uh, Free nights and weekends. You know what I'm saying? Between 7 at night. Some plans was 9 at night. But we're going to say 7 at night and 6 in the morning, you can talk free. And then it was Monday through Thursday. Uh, Monday through Friday, actually. And then the rest of the weekend, you can talk free. Free nights and weekends. No Kia phones. <laughs> but um, they had those back then. But, you know, phones weren't as common they didn't have no social media or anything like that they may have had my space i don't really remember so nevertheless twin he's out there what i say tj or jt heck i done got uh confused which one but one of the whichever twin got out <laughs> he's he's doing his thing he's sending his brother like 100 150 bucks a week every week that's his brother's keeper that's his man's he never would betray his brother Plus, he's visiting him every week. Now, oftentimes, when you're in prison, if somebody's a convicted felon, unless they're an immediate family member, they can't even come back and visit. But because he was an immediate family member, once he was able to get off of parole, because he got off parole before the other twin got out. So once he was able to get off parole, he could come and visit his brother. He started to visit his brother. Um, and when he's coming to visit his brother, now, let me explain that to you. Because, so let me, let me take it a step back. Let me take it a step back. <sighs> We're going to rewind it back for a second. He began to visit his brother because after his brother did the 24-month setback that they gave him, they went ahead and served him out. Meant, go ahead and do the rest of your time. Well, at that point, he, he had done like three and a half years. He had an eight-year sentence. Then you could take classes in prison. Back then, they would give you 60 days, like anytime you completed certain classes. So he probably had another, 
year and a half, two years left to be completely done with his sentence. So during that time, the other brother, he had served out. You see what I'm saying? He had completed uh, parole. So he's able to come and visit his brother now. Well, they used to do this little thing to where, look, bro, I'm going to wear the exact same thing that you wearing. Tell me what you wearing today or whatever. And I'm going to wear the exact same thing. They would switch out. Literally switch out. The twin that was out would come on a Saturday. Visitations was from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. He would come on a Saturday. Um, they would go in the bathroom or one. You could go to the restroom or whatever. And when he came back or whatever, visitations would be over with. And I don't know why I said he could go to the bathroom because that really doesn't make a difference. That <laughs> didn't really have anything to do with what I was talking about. But I'm not editing, so I'm not going to edit that out. It's real live TVs, real Kins, TV 859. You get it raw, have you want it. Pause. So they would switch out at the end of visitation. So when visitation would end, JT was supposed to go back to his dorm, but TJ would go back to the dorm. And JT would go home. JT would go to the streets. And he would do that. And then the next day he would come back and they would switch out. They did that so often. You know, early on, you didn't really have a whole lot of rats. You didn't have a whole lot of people that, you know, tell everything you do in prison. There was a couple people that knew, but those were the individuals that were really close to them. And you know, grew up and knew. Everybody else didn't know. They were literally identical twins. Same haircut, same everything. So you say, well, how would he possibly know what he's wearing to where he can put on the exact same outfit? Well, in prison, you can take pictures. You can take a picture, pay $2 for a picture, and you send it home. So they had a, it was a devised plan. It wasn't anything they just came up with off the top of their head because this is something that's very, very serious if you get caught. So he would send his pictures home. Hey, this is what I got. These are the clothes that I have. Which the other twin knew because he was already, you know, sending him clothes, sending him. So this is what I got. This is what I'm going to wear. Okay, I'm going to go and get the exact same shirt. If I can't get the exact same shirt, I'm going to get the same color, the same, you know, to where you can't really even tell who's looking at the exact same shirt that an individual has on. Shoes is no problem. Pants is no problem. It's mainly the shirt. So they would literally switch out. They didn't do it every week. But that's how much love that he had for his twin brother. I'm going to go in here, even though I'm free in, in the free world, I'm going to stay out here, give you a little time to do what you need to do, and then we'll switch back. Everything was all cool. It was all gravy. Never a problem. One Saturday night, twin that was free, like I said, we're going to just say it was TJ. He decides to go to the strip club. He's, you know, he, he goes to the strip club. Just kicking it. Not bothering nobody, nothing. Now, mind you, this TJ, he's supposed to be in the, in, in the pen. His brother's there holding him down, knowing that he'll be back tomorrow, and we're going to switch out, and, you know, I'm going to go back, you know, do my regular life, do me. He's in the strip club. He didn't really drink much social drink or what have you dude comes up to him he's like what's up bro uh you driving tj's like uh nah 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 what's up man he's like nah man we walked up here man and it's raining real bad they knew each other knew of each other we was just you know seeing if we if we could get a ride you know to the hood tj's like nah man i ain't driving man you know what i'm saying so he goes back to his table he has a drink or two, a couple of dances or whatever. Now, at this particular strip club, you can leave out the back door. You can come through the front. You can leave back out through the front. Or you could go through the back door. The back door. Um, and, and the club, from you all, for you all that know, is called Thumpers. From You you know, the ones that uh, I'm referring to Thumpers, rather. For So if you're from Lexington or if you're from the surrounding areas or whatever, back in the 90s, you know about Thumpers. It was a hood strip club. Everybody used to go to Thumpers. He decides to leave probably 30 minutes later. But when he gets up to walk out, he notices 
that these dudes is behind him, you know, following him. He perceives in his mind that they're following him. So he's walking out the door. He's kind of looking and he sees that they're behind him. So he's walking. They're walking. It's like three dudes. He's walking to his car. He's just trying to get to his car. He don't want no smoke, no trouble. After all, he's not even supposed to be out. His brother is holding him down. As I mentioned, he's not even supposed to be out. He's walking to the car, but he knows that something's not right. He just knows he senses it. So he hits the little, you know, the little key fob or whatever. Boom, the trunk pops. He does that probably, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 feet before he gets to the car. So the dudes are still following him, but they're not saying anything. Dude's pump truck, uh, the, <laughs> the trunk pops. He got a shotgun, pistol grip, pump on my lap at all times. He didn't have it on his lap. He had it in the trunk. And it's crazy because he used to keep nothing stayed in that trunk. Nothing. I'm talking about, you know, how you look at somebody's trunk and it's all type of junk and this and that or kids football helmets and cleats and nothing. It was clean like the day when he bought it. But he had that pump in the clunk, in the in the, uh, the trunk. He gets to the trunk. He's praying that he can just get to the trunk. He gets to the trunk, pulls that thing out, turns around. What's happening? He cocks it. Pop, pop. What's happening? What's happening? No, 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 bro. It ain't nothing like that. No, no. No, you y'all thought y'all was just gonna rob me or something? No, bro. It wasn't nothing like that. We ain't. Next thing you know, one of the dudes. I guess twin got caught slipping or whatever. He pulls out. When he pulls out, twin fires. Boom. But he ain't even trying to hit nobody. He just fires. Boom. When he fires, it gave him an opportunity to run around to the side of the car. He couldn't just jump in the car and drive off. He runs around to the actual, actually the front of the car. So it's a all out gunfight. Bow, bow, bow. Boom. Boom. He's firing. They firing. It's a out like wild, wild west, man. Outside of the strip club. Hopefully somebody from Lexington or, or Kentucky that's familiar with Thumpers, they, they can get in my comments and verify it used to go down at Thumpers. Dude never should have even been there. I used to go to Thumpers, but I stopped going at night because I understood that this is not the place to be. Wild Wild West. They shooting it out. Boom! Boom! Well, as they're shooting it out, police just happen to be in that area. They hear those loud gunshots. Police pull up. The other dudes, they, they scatter. They run. They on foot. They run. They get away. They approach Twin. Twin throws the gun when he sees the police or the, the, the shotgun. But the police has already pretty much seen that he was the one doing the shooting. They come over there asking him, you know, what's going on? Of course, he's like, man, I don't know nothing, man. You know, Shoot. I heard some shooting, but I ain't got nothing to do with nothing. I'm getting my car. I'm 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 going home. I wasn't shooting. I don't got anything or whatever. Yeah, police don't believe that. Put him in cuffs, detain him. He's not under arrest, but he's in cuffs for his uh, personal safety. They end up arresting him, taking him to jail. Now the thing about it, when they take him to jail, he has his identification on him. When he has his identification on him, <laughs> this is crazy. He has his identification on him. So it's like, hold on. They didn't catch it initially. They didn't catch it. They didn't know that his brother was actually locked up. I'm trying not to confuse myself with the story. So you all bear with me. He has his identification on him. And his out of... If they had known, they would have known, okay, he's supposed to be in prison right now. But they didn't catch it. Again, this is the late 90s. The technology wasn't the same. They take him to the county jail. They charge him with felon in possession of a fire with a handgun, even though it was a shotgun. But they, they charge him with a handgun. Actually, it might have been a firearm. Whichever one it was, they charged him with possession of it and wanting endangerment. Because when you're shooting, somebody else could have got hit, could have got shot or whatever. And they charged him with it. He gets to jail. 
he don't know what to do. He don't know what to do. Because it's like, wow. <laughs> I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be in prison. I'm not trying to get my brother knocked. I'm literally supposed to be in prison right now. They go and they take the fingerprints. He's trying to avoid the fingerprint man. You're not going to avoid the fingerprint man when you get arrested on a felony. And especially with a gun charge. But any felony. So they go over. They fingerprint him or whatever. He's sitting there in the waiting area. And the people come back. And it's like. That's when they discover that he's supposed to be in prison through his fingerprints. He's supposed to be in prison. How are you out here? So they do whatever checks that they do, make sure there's no escapes, make sure because they're at the time, they're not aware that he's a twin. So they're trying to figure out he's supposed to be in the Department of Corrections. But we have him in the Fayette County Detention Center with these charges. But he's not even supposed to be here. So whatever they do, they end up figuring it out. He ends up getting knocked or charged with the charges that I told you about. In addition to um, um, identity theft, which it wasn't, but that's what they charged him with. And something else. I don't even remember. I'm in a Commonwealth state. So they just make up charges as they go. Kentucky is a Commonwealth state. They literally make up charges as they go. So then they go back once they realize two plus two is four. And they go back to the brother JT that's locked up. They get him. They throw him in the hole. He don't know what's going on, but he pretty much figures that they done caught on. They hit him with identity theft and the other charge that they hit the JT with. They transfer him immediately to behind the walls. He goes to the hole immediately. Immediately he goes to the hole. In prison, they'll throw you in the hole, and um, you're in the hole basically um, until further notice. So he goes to the hole, and... <laughs> The whole thing is just really, really like a, uh, it's just crazy how it went down. So the twin that was out there on the streets, he ends up getting charged. He gets additional time. I don't remember exactly how much time that he got. Um, I want to say he gets an additional seven or eight years. Um, that's the one that's already locked up. The one that had been out that was on parole and he walked his parole down, completed his parole for you all that don't know what uh, walk the parole down means. He ended up getting uh, the same time, another seven, or eight years on top of the time that he had. And stipulations, like once they pled guilty to the charges, they could never be incarcerated together. Like they could never, ever be at the same facility. Wild, wild story, man. But it just goes to show the love that one brother had for the next, I guess it's vice versa, the love that they have for each other. I don't know if I could do that. Twin or no twin. If I'm out here on these streets and I'm enjoying the, the, the perks of life and I can go to my refrigerator whenever I want, I can leave my house, I can jump in my car or me and my girl, we can go mess around, fool around with, and they go stay in a prison. I mean, I don't know. Maybe I could for a night for my twin. But it's just such a big risk that they uh, actually took. I don't know if I could do that. So, they end up getting the additional time. They do their time. Years goes, you know, forward or whatever, past. And they get out. They get out. They done calm down. They older. They still twins. They still tight. They One of them ends up passing away. The one that passed away was the dude that, um... Actually, it was the twin that, um... The, the twin that passed away was the one that was didn't make parole he was the one that got the 24 month setback and then they served him out he passed away and during that time shortly after that the mother passed away neither one of them had kids so the twin that was still out he just felt like man it's just me it was just those two they didn't have any kids, as I mentioned. The mother had passed away. The father was never really active in their lives in the first place. So it was just like, he was just, he didn't care. He got to getting high. And he kind of turned into, I don't want to say a joke, because I don't want to call anybody a joke. But he just got to, it was like you would look at him and be like, man, what happened? Your career, your future was so promising. 
what happened. He just didn't care anymore. He would often he would often say, "Man, I just I just want to go be with my brother, man. I'm just here for my mom." And then when his mom passed away, he it was really all the way over. He didn't care. And so when I ran into him, I thought about this story, and it's crazy because this story has never crossed my mind before. And I ran into him, man, and you know, we gave each other dap, man. We embraced, man. What's up, man? How you doing? He asked me for a couple of dollars, said he was doing bad, man. You know, I gave him thirty, forty dollars, man, and just it's sad. You know, so there's many, many messages in this video. You know, you got drugs, you got just the system, you got just the, the street life, the fast money. They were on track to do something very special in their lives. I'm talking about these twins, man. They were very, very good. JT and TJ, they were very, very good in sports, man. And they were smart in school, too. You get a 2728 in school, not even trying. Just think of what you would have had if you really, really tried. In streets, man. Sometimes in streets, man, they'll they'll just they'll swallow you whole. You know, pause, double pause. But that's the, the truth of the matter. You know, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, man. Hopefully, man, he's able to uh, get his life on track, man. And, and, and it's actually um, TJ, I believe. Hopefully, he's able to get his life on track, man, and maybe go to a rehab, counseling, or just get off from drugs, man, and, and, and really, really be the person that he was put here to be, man. You know what I mean? Because in the streets, man, you lose every time. 100 out of 100 times. You're going to lose, man. Anytime you youngsters think about getting in these streets, think about these twins, man. JT and TJ. Promising athletes. You should dress alike. Came up together. Never argued. Never fought. Never rode for each other. If one was getting jumped by 10 dudes, the other one's going to jump in. It's going to be 10 on 2. Rode for each other, man. That fast money. Just not where it's at, man. Stairs, not elevator, stairs. You can eventually take the elevator, but to get to that status where you can take the elevator, you got to put many, many years in of walking them stairs. My good buddy that I met, I never knew him a day in my life, man, Jason V. He often comments on my um, on my videos. Jason V, y'all go check him. He got a YouTube channel, man. He got like 5,000 subs, and it's primarily about his son, you know, about his family. He's a family man. His son uh, is on the wrestling team. He got a beautiful wife, a beautiful daughter. Y'all go check him out. Jason V, man. Go check him out, man. Support his channel. But he often tells me, man, slow, steady, man. Slow and steady. You don't got to rush. And I appreciate that from him all the time because I get frustrated sometimes and, and I feel like my videos should be getting so many more views. And I f But I have to understand. I have to understand this is a process. Now I'm getting way more views than I was getting six weeks ago. I would do a video and maybe get 40, 50, 100 views if I was lucky. Frustrated. I got 3,500 subs. Why is this going on? And Jason, would, it was like he would always talk me down off the off the ledge. You're going to get there, man. You're going to get there just slow and steady, man. You're definitely going to get there, man. You got to build your foundation. And once you build that foundation, that foundation can never be broken. So shout out to Jason V, man. You know, um, yeah, Real Kins TV, man. Hope y'all enjoyed the video, man. Salute.